my talk. Here we go. Uh. Ah, he said he living life as a gringo. Where you question, where you fit, and every time you mingle, they say you do this with not enough that. My rapping is really bad. <laughs> this life as a gringo. Yes, hello and welcome to another episode of Life as a Gringo. I am Dramos, of course. And man, holidays are are right around the corner, which is crazy to say. I just realized that next week is is Thanksgiving. And then, man, that, that's going to fly by. And the next thing you know, it is Christmas. It is New Year's and the year is gone. I am off next week. So just giving you all a heads up. But the holidays tends to bring family members together that maybe you don't see on a regular basis. And and that brings people who have differences of opinion or maybe has you kind of reliving certain childhood dynamics to a degree, right? You're sitting down at a dinner table with your your parents and possibly your your siblings and, and all that comes along with that and all that that sort of brings up for many of us. The wounded inner child that lives, you know, inside of, of all of us, right? It's really me tapping into that part of myself that I feel like I've neglected for so long out of sort of safety, then many of us are carrying that around in different ways. You know, the the reality is you don't have to have like a violent upbringing. You don't have to have what is sort of considered, you know, child abuse. You can just be affected by the dynamic of your parents, you know, the way they are between each other, uh, the, the unhealed wounds that they have, right? I kind of wanted to just do an episode ahead of the holidays that that spoke a bit about that and, and maybe brought some awareness to some of us, you know, going into what can be a really complex time, uh, you know, of, of the year and, and one that could bring up a lot of emotions. So I thought it'd be good to kind of have a bit more of an awareness to what we might be feeling or what might be coming up and, and do a bit of a deep dive. I found this really kind of comprehensive uh, I don't know if it's like a, a, a paper or, or, or whatever it is, but it's from eggshellTherapy.com. And I'll leave the link in the show notes so you can really you know read it in depth if you want to. But and the dynamics that they talk about, the toxic dynamics that they talk about, there are five of them that they mentioned in this article. And then also signs that you have complex trauma from your toxic family uh, dynamics. And then for our Mijente segment, I'll, I'll kind of give you all a bit about you know what I've been working through how I've sort of adjusted that family dynamic and kind of where we stand today. Let's kind of start with the experts a bit. Let's do. That deep dive first in a segment we call for the people in the back. Say a lot for the people in the back. Say a lot for the people in the back. So let's first start with the toxic family dynamics and the intense, highly sensitive and gifted, right? And again, this is from eggshelltherapy.com. I have a link in the, the show notes, but they say, quote, being the parent of a sensitive and emotionally gifted child has its own rewards. However, parents need to be very mature and highly aware. Many do not have all that it takes. Most of the time, parents do not exploit or abuse their sensitive children on purpose. Their limited understanding or experience simply gets the best of them. And, and for me, I, just that first paragraph is already resonating. I'm, I'm curious for anybody listening if it, if it is for you as well. Now, going on, they say, quote, the families of emotionally intense children typically end up addressing the situation in one of two ways. They allow themselves to love the child, however painstakingly, or they reject the child for his or her strangeness. In an experiment conducted by Andrew Solomon involving interviews with over 400 families, it was observed that in the case of having atypical children, would-be good parents were extraordinary, going the extra mile if they, if a need arose, and the would-be bad parents were downright abusive. He concluded that having an exceptional child exaggerates parents' tendencies. On the surface, we look just fine. We were provided with all of the material things we needed, clothing, food, et cetera. But the way we feel inside does not coincide with what our appearance portrays. There is sometimes pressure to keep up the illusion of a, quote, normal, happy child from a normal, happy family. Our parents and society tell us we are well, but the fact that we don't feel it, that we don't feel this way growing up makes us confused. Speaking to, to this specifically, the the frustrating thing is like feeling like there's something wrong with you, right? Because you you are reminded 
be it by your parents or by yourself, like, oh, look, you have all these toys, you have, you know, all these different things. And, and I can remember specifically my parents or, or my dad being like, you know, you don't know what struggle is like when I struggle, I didn't have any of this stuff. And it like brings on this guilt as to why you don't feel completely happy when I think the the reality of what they're what they're talking about is that your parents were just ill equipped, you know, for for handling you as a as a child and, and handling your specific needs. And this article talks about children who are, uh, you know, emotional or sensitive. And, and um, I don't say that in a way of being weak. I think it, it's maybe kids who are a bit more attuned to what's going on around them. Right. And a bit more aware emotionally and a bit more aware of their own uh, feelings, even if they don't have the vocabulary for it. Right. That was probably difficult for for my parents to completely understand, right? And and not understanding the depth of of kind of maybe the needs possibly, right? Now now moving on in this article, they they mentioned five different toxic family dynamics, and uh, number one is scapegoating. And they say that when emotionally sensitive children were born into neurotypical families, it was difficult for the family to understand them. As such, they quickly became the castaway. Quote the different one or the difficult child, right? And they talk about it takes a lot of patience, maturity, and strength to bring up an intense and emotionally sensitive child, right? And and I think that, you know, this speaks to a lot of people who, who grow up feeling like the black sheep of their family, you know, uh, feeling like the one that is alienated. And I think that that's kind of typical in, in friend groups, right? You always have that one friend that kind of gets ragged on a little bit more or you know, in, in school, you have the kids that are, are kind of the outcasts that, that take the brunt of the bullying. And I, I think it's sort of human nature to a degree to qu kind of quickly visualize in a group dynamic who is the one that doesn't fit in and then sort of almost get band together against them. And, and sadly, in this sort of dynamic, it, it happens with the very people that you live with that are your caretakers, that are your loved ones, you know. And that I can kind of relate to. I don't think that I was completely scapegoated, but I was definitely the different one. You know, my, my sister was the, you know, like perfect child. You know, I, I can remember teachers uh, when my parents would get called to school saying, like, I can't believe that's your sister because she was the one who never got in trouble. She was incredibly quiet. And I was the loud, outspoken one who was always getting into some sort of trouble. I, I was the, the difficult child. And that comparison game uh, ends up typically happening. Right. Uh, now, the, the toxic family dynamic trait number two parentification, right? And this is, quote, parental guidance and protection are crucial in developing a sense of safety and foundation with our psyche. Some parents, however, cannot provide this due to insufficient emotional resources. If this is the case, the parent-child the parent -child roles are reversed. The child becomes the parent and the parent becomes the child. The parent-child role Reversal is known as parentification, which can be a form of a toxic family dynamic, right? And this is, you know, maybe parents who are not emotionally mature, not ready to take responsibility. And sadly, the the kid has to feel like they have to take care of that parent, right? They have to protect their their own parent and and they don't get to live a, a, a childhood. It's it's no secret why, you know, people would be harboring certain traumas when they don't feel like they got to actually live a real childhood themselves, you know, where they feel like they didn't get to have that freedom that, that you're supposed to have as a, a kid because you had to take on adult responsibilities because sadly the adults in your life, you know, didn't want to, to grow up or, or were emotionally, you know, incapable of doing so. Now, number three um, of, of these, you know, toxic family dynamics is having emotionally unavailable parents, right? And, and they talk about how some caregivers can be emotionally unresponsive to their child due to mental illness, limited psychological capacity, work or health demands, and neuroatypical traits like Asperger syndrome, ADHD, or autism. This unresponsiveness, in turn, makes the children feel shut out and abandoned. Right, and again, I think all of this is is speaking to I think a lot of a lot of things that you might be aware of, but at the same time, understanding how much of an effect all of this this has on, on all of us, right? How our parents' behavior and their lack of awareness or lack of work in, in, in healing gets in some way passed down to all of us, right? And, and it's important to be aware of that, right? And let, let's put it in the, in the terms of kind of what we're talking about, this idea of the holiday you know, season, right? And, and all the feelings that it tends to bring up, right? You know, often as, as kids, 
we internalize these these interactions that we have with our caregivers with our parents and we we sort of take the blame for it right you know dad is mad because of me you know um i i had too much energy and that's why dad got frustrated and yelled at me and like went upstairs right and that's just a hypothetical kind of thing so we're we're internalizing all of the blame here and and i think that we end up getting you know more more frustrated with our ourselves and looking down upon um you know our ourselves but at the same time we're not seeing the sort of real thing that's happening with our parent in front of us right we're not able to see that a what they're doing is wrong and and, and even if you are able to recognize that i think that understanding where it comes from that they are dealing with their own mental illness or some other sort of limiting uh, you know thing that that is going on with them mentally understanding that doesn't mean anything about you and in turn having a bit of empathy when maybe they do lash out in a certain way when they do try and make something about you and not empathy to the point that you allow yourself to be disrespected or abused but maybe empathy to the to the point that you don't allow yourself to go into this negative kind of uh, tailspin of emotions when a lot of these dynamics sort of replay in your in your adult life, right? You you kind of allow yourself to take away some of that sting and some of that emotion because you're looking at the other person as as somebody who is working through something, somebody who is wounded, somebody who is dealing with their own shit and is making them lash out in that way, right? You know, when some of these situations do begin to come up, um, and I find myself getting frustrated. There have been a lot of times where I've been able to kind of put a little bit of distance between myself and that emotion because I'm seeing them for the, you know, the the hurt inner child that they're carrying around. Right. And maybe they are still going to act out. Maybe they're still going to, you know, say some some mean things. But I think your ability to be aware of where it might be coming from allows you to take some of that emotional charge away from it. And, you know, whatever they, they say, what they say, they do what they do. Uh, but you don't allow it to kind of ruin your night or, or ruin your moment. And moving on to the the other toxic family dynamics, this is number four. And this one is called enmeshment, right? And according to separation individual theory, and this is as of 1975, a study done, babies have a natural symbiotic relationship with their mothers at birth. However, they still need to have a sense of self and know their mothers as a different entity from them in order to develop healthily. Some parents have a hard time letting go and separating themselves from their children, usually due to their own insecurities or unfulfilled lives. This eventually denies the child opportunities to take risks and make productive mistakes and become resilient. And I can relate to this to a degree. My mom was definitely a helicopter mom. Um, and they talk about how anxious parents may subtly send emotional messages to their children like, quote, I cannot survive without you. Don't go don't grow up. You can't go. You can't make it without me. It's a dangerous world out there. I have a lot of self-doubt or I have uh, felt like I've needed to rely on other people in order for me to find success or, or to be able to accomplish something, you know, and I it, it's taken a long time to break out of that. And I still sometimes have to fight through that, that sort of old trauma loop of like, man, I need somebody's help or I need this and that. Right. And and I definitely was was somebody who rebelled a lot when it came to this. And and I think that I, I you know, saw it as like a judgment of me being incapable. But to be honest, you know, it, it still is something that I, I leaned on as well. Right. You know, um, and and allowed to kind of hold me back from making certain decisions. I, I think this definitely has has caused me to have a bit of like, um you know, second guessing. And again, it's not something that my mom didn't harm. You know, it was because she she loved me and she was unaware of her own anxieties. I think parents out there who are listening to this, um, it, it's also good probably to have this awareness to understand that even if you are loving your child, there's still sort of, you know, things that you have to be aware of and certain uh, human experiences that we all have to have, you know, failure and, and, and things of that nature that are necessary for us to kind of grow up and, and become full fledged adults in this world. The last thing they talk about here is uh, number five in the, the toxic family dynamic. And they say competition and oppression, right? Parenthood comes with an array of emotions, anger, joy, grief, pride, and so on. While it is not commonplace to talk about it in society, jealousy is one of these emotions that parents can feel towards their children. When this envy is unmanaged, 
it can become a toxic family dynamic and erode the health of the whole family system. Parents with unfulfilling lives may be particularly threatened by seeing what their children have, opportunities that were not available to them in their youth. As they watch their children grow, their childhood wounds are reopened, and they go back psychologically to when they themselves were children. Sometimes parents can begin to perceive their children as competitors. It, it's fascinating because, again, it shows you the chain of fucking trauma that happens when it goes unresolved and unchecked, right? Now, I can't really relate to this one, but, you know, I, I can imagine there's, some, you know, people out there, tons of people who feel like they've had to live this this sort of dynamic throughout the, the, the course of, of their life. Again, I don't think that there's an excuse for anybody to treat you like shit or, or lesser than, but I, I think that we have to recognize that oftentimes it's not necessarily a personal attack against us. It's them and their own traumas. And again, that doesn't make it hurt any less when you are able to look at people as human and as struggling it makes it a bit easier to kind of tolerate some of the the behavior that that really frustrates you about them. And we all have that. There are certain things about myself that I'm sure the people in my life are incredibly frustrated by, right? We're able to have a bit of empathy, knowing each other a bit more and, and having that close relationship because we're aware of some of the things that we're struggling with and trying to work past, right? And we're aware of the overall character of the person and and we're able to kind of not necessarily give them a free pass, but not take it personally. And I want to touch on, on this part of the article that is seven signs that you have complex trauma from toxic family dynamics, right? And I'm going to try and go through this relatively quickly. Here are, are some of the signs for, for those of you listening and kind of like wondering about how maybe some of these dynamics have shown up in your life or, you know, some of the things I brought up resonate with you and you're curious about how you might be acting them out now as, as an adult. And the first one they bring up is, is something that I, I relate to. And it says, you become disassociated and feel dead inside, right? And and this one, it, it's not something that you want to want to be like happily telling somebody that you feel dead inside. And it's, it's probably not, you know, I don't know, it's a really aggressive way to word this, but I, I, I can definitely sort of relate to that, especially the disassociation part, right? And they say, quote, cumulative complex trauma caused by toxic family dynamics has the power to force our children into foreclosure. One, our true self is the part of us that is free, spontaneous, and fully alive. But having been emotionally abandoned by our caretakers, we have also learned to bury our true selves. Such disconnection comes not from one single traumatic experience, but from an accumulation of painful emotional memories. When our enthusiasm was met with coldness, our passion misunderstood, our feelings silenced, or our actions punished, the innocent, most alive part of us, our soul, our true self, our inner child is forced into hiding, right? You know, I think for me, I, I know I developed the defense mechanism when I felt like the things that I got excited about and then tried to express were not met with that same enthusiasm, right? So I was let down. Or when I expressed an interest of mine and it was brushed off or uh, it wasn't understood and there wasn't really an effort for it to be understood, I, I began to do that less and less, right? And and I think that that is a form of, of disassociating. You know, I, I suppressed those feelings of excitement. I suppressed my enthusiasm for things and, and kept it bottled up, right? For sure, struggle with as a result of, of, of kind of my family dynamic to a degree and it's something that i've been trying to to work through but it's incredibly difficult and uh, i'll try and touch more on that and i'm gonna hit this segment the number two on this list they say is you may feel defective children naturally blame themselves for what happens to them when they are bullied they believe it's because they are not good enough if they seek attention from the parents but are neglected they believe they are too needy this plants a seed for the complex trauma that that follows, right? And again, that's something I was I was touching on, right? The the idea that we as kids blame ourselves, and I, I resonate with this a bit. Why aren't my interests being met with an excitement? Why aren't my ideas being celebrated? Well, it must mean that I'm not good enough, right? And it's something that again I struggle with here as as an adult, and I often am my own worst critic, right? I mentioned that that spoken word poetry that I've been doing, you know, some of those those ones that I recorded are as you know, are like two years old. And those self-deprecating thoughts came in, those 
man, that, that self-doubt creeped into my mind. This isn't that good. You shouldn't be putting it out there. Just stop working on it. And like it made me, you know, step away from it for months until like one day I just felt like I wanted to check it out. And when I listened back to it, I was like, oh, wow, this is actually far better than I thought it was than I was giving myself credit for. And that's how this shows up for me in my my adult life. Now, number three on this list is they say you may be highly anxious if our parents are emotionally unstable or if due to their vulnerable or due to their vulnerabilities, we feel the need to take care of them. We become the little adult at home. We are hyper vigilant, always watching out for the smallest clues about our parents' emotional fluctuations so that we can protect ourselves and our siblings. Hyper empathic tendency that is a result of complex trauma doesn't go away and we carry with it into adulthood. And I recognize this a bit. I, you know, I don't suffer from extreme anxiety, but I have anxiety. And I think that a lot of having to predict, you know, my my father's mood or how to sort of quell a situation. And I, I think I learned this from my mother, how to de-escalate a situation with my father who, you know, was, was dealing with his own shit and, and you know, would, would yell a lot and, and, and this and that, you know, having to learn how to maneuver around that, I think has made me sort of hyper aware of what's going on around me in, in other dynamics in my life and, and also has made me an incredibly anxious adult to, to a degree. Now, number four, they say you may resort to compulsion and addiction to cope. Our brain is designed to protect us when we come across a particularly difficult or traumatic situation. It will be stored in a way that is frozen in time as complex trauma. We may not even remember it. We're not sure what triggers to, what triggers us. But our suppressed memories come out in the form of uncontrollable mood swings, persistent sadness, depression, and explosive anger. And and I think to me, one of the the points I want to harp on that we're we're kind of seeing consistently is like that emotion has to go somewhere, right? Many of us will try and bury or suppress how we're feeling, our our sadness, disappointment, anger, whatever it may be. And, and as kids, you know. Uh, there's generally not space for that, right? I don't think parents, especially in our community, are particularly great at being open to hearing uh, a little kid expressing their, uh, you know, uh, they're they're not approving of the way that their parent is is parenting, essentially, right? Or that their parent hurt their feelings, right? I know for me, if I was to express that as a kid, it would be brushed off. I mean, shit. Even as an adult, um, there are times I think that my my father doesn't want to doesn't want to uh, accept some of the things that I'm saying. So I, I, I think that the, the point of, of what I'm saying is that like all of those feelings and emotions, they have to come out somewhere. And if you suppress it and don't do that work, they can come out in, in sort of these, these you know, ways of, of mood swings and, and depression and these triggers, you know, and, and then, you know, when it talks about um, addiction, you know, as a means to cope, you know, it, it, it's another form of, of trying to suppress those feelings, right, that you don't feel in control of um, and, and the addiction, you know, to drugs or alcohol or sex or money, whatever it might be. You know, these compulsions uh, help kind of continue that numbing process, right? Now, number five, they say you are fearful of intimacy and love. They say, quote, if you have been trapped by toxic family dynamics for a long time, potentially trust independence and acceptance all require a degree of vulnerability that your wounded skin finds hard to bear. All of our life, you are caught between the intense need for kinship and the extreme fear of, of contact. And it's like that that in the, the middle area where it's like you, you don't want to be alone, but at the same time, you are too fearful of committing to somebody or too fearful of getting close to, to anyone, you know, the fear of, of of being hurt were affected in, in various ways. I think all of these things don't have to be, you don't have to be like just one of these uh, traits or one of these symptoms affects you. I think that we all probably pick up on, on bits and pieces. I don't think I've been afraid of, of, you know, intimacy in the form of, 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 of settling down, but I've been afraid in the form of truly being able to trust somebody with myself, being completely open and vulnerable. You know, and and I think that that's something that I've been able to work through in in my relationship that I'm in now. You know, because I think a safe space has been created. But you know, I I think always seeing my vulnerability, always seeing 
my trauma and my wounded inner child as like something that was going to be shamed, you know, especially as a man thinking that this was a sign of weakness, you know, that if I'm uh, talking about like, you know, my, that my, my parents didn't understand me as a kid, like that sounds, you know, incredibly, um, you know, just silly as, as an adult, right? In comparison to like people who, who maybe were real victims of physical abuse in, in various ways, right? And, and you begin to play that comparison game. And like, I can imagine many men out there feel that way. And when you begin to really, you know, put yourself out there and talk about these things, you know, it's scary to think that you might lose uh, that sort of manliness, right, that that we're told we need to have if we want to secure, you know, a, a woman in our life, right? And, and I think that those are, are all, again, dynamics that eventually end up playing out into our adulthood that are from just childhood trauma and, and also just bullshit societal constructs, you know, that, that really don't serve us. Now, number six out of this list, they say you damage the love you have, right? And they say that neuroscientists have found that parents' responses to our attachment-seeking behaviors especially during the first two years of our lives, encode our view of the world. If as infants we have consistent attachment interactions with an, at, with an attuned, available, and nurturing caregiver, we will be able to develop a sense of safety and trust. In contrast, when our parents are emotionally unavailable to us, we internalize the message that the world is a frightening place. When we are in need, no one will be there. This forms a complex trauma that is hard to that is too hard to beat. They talk about that, how this results in deep fear of abandonment, right? You're scared of somebody leaving you. And as, as adults, any kind of distance, even a brief and even a brief one may trigger you to re-experience the original pain of being left alone, dismissed or uh, disdained. And, and that, that shows you, you know, there are often people who, who maybe, uh, you know, are incredibly insecure in relationships or, or, um, I don't know, you might call somebody clingy or something like that. And I, I think it's interesting to kind of hear where these dynamics sort of come from. And I think also as a partner, it begins to make you a bit more aware of what you may need to give, you know, the, the your significant other in order to make them feel comfortable in in a, a, a relationship. Interesting and important and, and sort of a good thing to take away when you begin to read you know, things like this and, and begin to understand how different people are affected and, and the way that it plays out in their adult life. Now, the last thing they, they talk about is uh, you sabotage your success, right? And they say that the toxic family dynamic may have led you to believe your success and happiness would threaten your siblings, attract envy, and somehow brand you as, quote, arrogant if you were high achieving. Perhaps your parents were too limited in their worldview to comprehend your gifts and deep down you carry a survivor's guilt that says if you achieve more than others or outgrow your family you are betraying them subconsciously you become frightened of your power i i definitely relate to this kind of to a degree because i know that i always sort of dumb down any of my successes and not even just when i'm speaking to somebody uh you know about them which which i i definitely do sort of play play down anything that i've done but also to myself, I, I tell myself that I'm a failure, that I haven't done enough, you know, uh, all of all of the above. And it's me downplaying all that I have achieved, you know. And they go on to say, expecting little of ourselves and others may have made sense when we were little people who lived at the mercy of unpredictable and explosive caregivers. But the expectation no longer serves us if we wish to step into a more prominent place and live fully. You do not need to be trapped by what has but what has happened in a toxic family dynamic that was not your making. And I think that that, to me, is a great, that that last sentence right there, I think, is a, a really important thing to fixate on. Understanding that you are not to blame for, for these things. You are not to blame for the way that people treat you, the way that they mistreat you, the way that they may disrespect you, right? A again, family dynamics are incredibly complicated. And, and again, for anybody who's going to be sitting down at the table with some really complicated people in their lives, right? I think having this understanding that what you're seeing from them, you know, is is more reflection of them and how they're dealing with their own trauma, their own shit, and, and less about you, right? I, I remember in 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 Hoffman them kind of giving an example, even beyond like your own parents, you know, in the with the holidays, you might be, you know, sitting down with in-laws who you may not be a huge fan of, right? Who have 
different world views than you. Or uh, I remember somebody talking about how one of their in-laws, you know, loved to just like brag about accomplishments or money or this car and this, that and the third. Right. And how it would be incredibly frustrating that that would be the, the topic of conversation and and that they would allow themselves even to be overpowered by that. Right. And, and make themselves smaller. Being aware of the fact that this is a person who is incredibly insecure and is feeling like they have to impress you in order to be accepted, like understanding that dynamic takes a bit away of like maybe the annoyance. And at the same time, understanding that you feeling the need to make yourself smaller is in fact sabotaging your, your own success, right? And that's something that you learned from your traumatic upbringing, right? And maybe that gives you the power to be a bit more expressive and confident in your in your voice and uh in in what you want to share to to the group dynamic a bit right and i think that leads us uh in, in a good way to kind of the me hit this segment I'll, I'll talk a bit about how i think my family dynamic has shifted as i've become more aware of kind of my own healing and own traumas All right, so I, I think I was kind of sprinkling in like personal tidbits throughout. So this doesn't have to be a whole long, uh, you know, segment about my own personal story, especially if you've been listening, you kind of know a lot about my my dynamic. And, um, you know, I did a whole episode with my parents, actually, first episode of the podcast, if you check that out from last season. But I think for me, being aware of of some of these dynamics and some of my own trauma and my own kind of wounded inner child, right? I, I've been having a lot of those was honest conversations with my parents recently, right? And I think that that has really helped our dynamic a bit. You know, I, I, I think we're we're more on a friendship level, and I think this kind of sort of begins to inevitably happen, you know, as you become older. But I, I've I've felt a shift. I felt a level of respect from my parents. And a level of respect for my opinion and my outlook that I've never felt before. And I think that that's a really healthy kind of, you know, growth between our dynamic that that really didn't exist again until pretty recently. You know, me having more confidence in myself then changes the way that I'm interacted with. Right. Changes the way that that people feel like they can speak to me. Um, or or just changes the dynamic of our our relationship, right? And sometimes that goes either way. You might have friends who, you know, are used to you kind of being the younger, you know, brother type or younger sister type of of the dynamic or the tag along friend, and they can't handle you having this newfound confidence and this newfound voice because it throws off, you know, what they feel secure about, you know, the dynamic of your friendship or your relationship. And and that's okay. Those people aren't meant to be in your life. But I think, you know, the your your loved ones and those who truly want the best for you, I, I, I think that you being able to show up in that way creates a far healthier dynamic, right? Because if you're not pushing yourself to kind of work past some of those traumas, you're you're again just sort of like recreating this whole loop. You end up putting people in a room together during the holidays, many of which have not done any work on themselves. But now are, you know, uh, adults and maybe a bit crankier than ever or, or you know, the kids have grown up and and now feel comfortable fighting back against the, the parents. But like neither one of you is aware of what's actually happening, what you're actually fighting against, uh, what traumas are actually, you know, being faced in this conversation. And it just becomes a very hostile in, in environment. The ability to be aware of the shit that you have going on, and I think also the ability to to humanize your parents a bit more, and to recognize that they are just a product of of another generation that was traumatized, and so on and so forth, I think begins to allow you to to shift, you know, this sort of uh, dynamic and, and the way that you know you all sort of speak to each other, right? And I think for me, another shift that has happened is me being more confident and me me doing this work has allowed me to show up far more authentically right and has allowed me to express parts of myself and be unafraid to do so and unafraid to use my voice and to express my opinion even if it goes against uh you know my sister or my father or my mother you don't walk away feeling like that little kid who had to like go run away to the basement because you know uh somebody hurt your feelings right there there is a power of, of feeling comfortable and confident enough to show up authentically, regardless of how anybody else is going to receive or, or perceive it, right? 
And I, I think that that's something that for me has been incredibly helpful and allowed me to have far healthier exchanges, you know, with with my family and with those uh, around me. And, and again, it's that that confidence from from doing some of this work and understanding that the things that have held me back or the things that cause depression or those feelings of unworthiness, understanding that those aren't actually based in the reality of me being unworthy or untalented or just being a sad individual. They're based upon the actions of of others, right? And the recognition of the fact that it's other people's actions that cause that, you know, allows me to then take power to my hands now as an adult where I'm more in control and I can sort of push back and not allow others to have that same effect on me. And I think that that's incredibly helpful. None of this is is going to eliminate completely those emotions or those feelings, but hopefully it allows this dynamic and these interactions to become a bit less painful, to feel a bit less heavy and and hopefully it allows you to show up a bit more like yourself in these situations, which I think inevitably allows you to walk away feeling just a bit better about the whole interaction. You know, even if you had a disagreement with somebody, even if they they showed the worst of themselves, when you're able to to you know meet that with empathy and and meet that with confidence, I think that it allows you to kind of maybe change your view on how that situation happened and, and allows you to not internalize so much of, of those feelings or uh, of, of those negative feelings or emotions that tend to come up uh, during during different dynamics. Now, with that in mind, I want to want to hear from y'all uh, uh, in kind of in regards to what we're talking about. I, I, I made it a little bit more general, but we'll we'll talk about it in our Ask a Gringo segment. Ask a Gringo. All right, so for our Ask a Gringo segment at DJ Dramos on Instagram, if you want to be a part of these conversations, I just simply ask people, what is something about the holidays you are not looking forward to? Because, of course, like I said, it brings up a, a lot for people. Uh, let's see. At JTriv860, titis tres leches that nobody eats. Man, as as uh, the self-proclaimed tres leches poppy, this is really... Uh, disappointing that that your titi makes a trash tres leches that is not even edible for everybody. To be honest, I wish somebody would bring tres leches cake to Thanksgiving dinner. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I might actually be the one to to do this because I think it's a travesty that tres leches cake is not a more uh, popular um, man treat or, around the world. This is a um, feel free to send that tres leches cake my way though. I want I want to see if if this is a uh, as trash as you're making it out to be. Let's see. Uh, this person wants to be anonymous. Uh, they said, feeling disconnected from my immediate family on issues that are important to me. Old family dynamics. My sister is a bit of a Taylor Swift. And I'm a bit of a Cardi B. We clash. It's, it's got to be incredibly alienating and and lonely to feel like you are the only one who feels a certain way, shares a certain thought process especially when they might be issues that are incredibly important to you. I mean, I touched on on political things and I think for for some of us politics and and issues of like race and and what's going on in the world, you know, they're far more important to to us and our well-being than maybe others. You know, I I I know I have some mixed uh family, right, who are not all uh, Latino, um, you know, some Italians in the bunch and, and, and things like that. They don't seem to understand it on the same level that, that I do. Right. And it's not as important. And, and uh, certain things that are deemed crazy or overly woke to them. I, I think you, you kind of just have to look at where they're they're coming from at, at, as far as their own human dynamic. You know what I mean? Like what what about them is making them them feel this way and, and remembering that it's not about you. You know, what what is coming at you, the way they're reacting to you is, is really little to do with you and, and mostly to do with them and their own shit. And could be them being overly entitled as a result of their upbringing, could be them feeling slighted by the world. I think it plays out in, in different dynamics. You know, uh, there, I know some of the, the family that I'm talking about feels like, you know, uh, they've had a harder life than needed or that, you know, somebody's out to get them and and, and they're, you know, uh, living life in that sort of, uh, you know, very panicked, very 
um, at a paranoid type of type of way and it, it blends into the way they view the world when it comes to politics you know and again regardless of whatever it might be i think trying to keep in mind that this is something that is a reflection of them and not you potentially helps you not take it so personally right it's uh it's easier said than done but i think that that's the goal right the the goal is never to change somebody else's mind because I think that that is a losing battle at the end of the day because we can't guarantee that, right? If that's what we go into this, uh, this, this, you know, meeting of the minds, be it dinner or whatever it is, like if you go into that expecting that when you argue your point hard enough, you're going to change somebody's mind. You're only setting yourself up for disappointment, for defeat, you know, and, and I think that that's what makes a lot of these situations so much more heavy and so, so much more sort of emotional because you're you're kind of going into it with this goal and like this end thing in sight like no i have to correct this wrong whereas when you just recognize that you can express your opinion your feelings the things that you're passionate about but i have zero expectation as to how this person is going to receive it or that i'm going to change their mind like i have to recognize the fact that they have their own shit that is making them not see things the way i am that is making them have a fucked up perception of the world whatever it might be and it's not my job to to change that, right? Hopefully by me expressing myself authentically uh, makes them see things a bit in a different, you know, see things a different way and maybe opens their eyes to something that they weren't keen to before. But if it doesn't, I can't allow myself to get frustrated about that, right? Because again, it's not my job to change them. I think the only thing I can do and the only thing I should have a, a goal of doing is expressing myself authentically, making sure that my idea and my voice is not getting trampled by somebody else, right? then I've won, you know, what I've set out to do because that's all we can do, right? We can't expect, again, to change the minds of other people who have all kinds of other complex shit going on in their, their head that makes them believe the way that they do. Now, with that in mind, let's uh, wrap everything we talked about in a neat little bow in a segment we call Conclusion Stew. Time for Conclusion Stew. I mean, I think I, I threw a lot at y'all, so I'm not gonna obviously recap everything that we talked about in this in this uh, in this show. Uh, again, the link to this article, the toxic family dynamics and complex trauma. I'm gonna put it in the show notes. I, I just wanted to point out and create an awareness as to why we feel the way that we do, why we interact with the world in the way that we do, and and why you know our parents, our caregivers, interact or interacted you know in the way that they did or do, right? Like. I think that the more you begin to understand why things affect you in a certain way or why they don't affect you or why people act in a certain way, you know, I, I think that that begins to take away a bit of the pain, a bit of the the charge from from some of these interactions that you may have with people, right? And I also think that it allows you to create awareness for yourself, like, what do I need to feel good in this situation? And again, the the key thing, if there's one thing you take away, it's understanding that the way people interact with you is not a reflection of you yourself. It is a reflection of them and, and their own trauma and their own work or lack of work, right? It has nothing to do with you. It doesn't mean you're not good enough uh, for, for somebody to treat you in a certain way. The, the reality is they would treat, you know, anybody given a certain dynamic that way, right? Like, and, and again, the idea that these are family dynamics, toxic family dynamics, that means that it's it's like a a, a dynamic that was created in the family that you lived in, right? So even if you're the one that they they treat, uh, you know, shitty out of everybody, this is a, a, a dynamic that was created by somebody else outside of yourself. And if it wasn't you, it would have been another member of the family that was treated as the black sheep, right? Like this is just them creating a certain dynamic based upon their own upbringing and their own unresolved trauma. I don't think anybody's holding a grudge against a kid who throws a temper tantrum, right? And if you think about it in that same manner, you're understanding that this person is acting out because of pain that they're feeling or they're suppressing, right? The, the biggest takeaway is just remembering anything that's happening, good or bad, with an interaction with someone, you know, is, is not a reflection of, of you yourself, but again, is a reflection of how they them see themselves, how they've been trained to, to treat others and, and, and trained to see the outside world based upon their own trauma and dynamics in their own family. So I think that's kind of the, the biggest takeaway from from all of that and i also just think being aware of the fact that you're not alone in reacting to certain situations right the the dynamics that your parents created or your caregiver created 
like just shows you there are so many other people who are reacting in a similar way to you and viewing the world in a similar way to you because of of their upbringing there's not something wrong with you again it is a dynamic that was created by your caregivers and you are naturally reacting in a certain way given the information that you were given essentially from them so again i think it's just something to to keep in mind hopefully it lightens the load a bit as we go into the holiday season you're interacting with people who you know there's a lot of history with and uh hopefully allows you to be a bit more aware of that a bit more aware of maybe what they need in that moment and and you know how you can create a healthier dynamic uh, by fulfilling maybe something that they're feeling empty about a, a trauma that they uh, might be you know acting out upon and i think that that begins to help the the healing overall when it comes to some of these really difficult family dynamics and with that in mind wishing y'all nothing but the best for the holiday season obviously we have one more show before the thanksgiving break but man just something to to keep in mind uh as you go into the season if you are a parent yourself and raising kids something to keep in mind and i, I think it just again all of this helps build up that self-awareness that allows us to to be the best version of ourselves and heal a lot of that that trauma to be better than, than the previous generation now with that said like subscribe comment give us a review all that stuff helps dramos.com for merch and uh man i'll catch you on thursday for our thursday trends episode until then Stay safe. Talk to you all soon.